Hey guys, it's Judy from Nutrition with Judy. Thanks for joining me today. While you're here, please make sure to like and subscribe. If you're listening to this on podcast, please make sure to leave a review as this allows my content to get in front of more people. And thank you for that. My name is Judy Cho and I am board certified in holistic nutrition. I focus on getting to root cause healing. And oftentimes that starts with the carnivore cures meat only elimination diet. Today, I had the pleasure of sitting down with Dr. Pete Delanoy, and we talk about everything related to gout and uric acid. I know there are some thoughts in the ketogenic carnivore space that once you go fully carnivore, fully ketogenic, that you should never have a gout flare and that gout is really related to metabolic syndrome. There's some truth and some nuance to that statement. And Dr. Pete and I get into a lot of that detail. Dr. Pete Delanoy is a PhD biochemist with 28 years of teaching experience and now has turned to a keto coach. His journey started almost three years ago when he was diagnosed with prediabetes. His journey started almost three years ago when he was diagnosed with prediabetes and suffered from gout attacks. He spent several months struggling with the medical establishment all the while watching his numbers get worse. And Dr. Pete started a coaching company, Ketonic Revolution, with his daughter, Tanner, to help people reverse diabetes, obesity, and cardiovascular disease. His approach to the reversal of chronic disease is by direct intervention, education, and by providing meaningful resources to his clients and the world at large. And Dr. Pete is a certified health coach with additional certifications through the Nutrition Network. I met Dr. Pete during the low carb Boca Raton conference, and he spoke about gout and uric acid. And I was so fascinated by the nuances he was sharing as to why people on a keto or carnivore diet can still have a gout flare. This conversation gets into all those nuances, and you may want to just listen as gout is more than just having crystals in a certain joint. Let's get right into the interview. Hi, Dr. Pete Delanoy. I'm very excited to have you on. Um, I know we spoke at a Boca Raton conference not too long ago, and I just wanted to further the conversation with you about gout and uric acid. I know you're a wealth of information on this topic. So uh, for those of the people listening and watching that don't know you, if you can introduce yourself. My name is Dr. Pete. And uh, to give you just some background, I was diagnosed with gout in 2016 and then prediabetes in 2019. And like a lot of people in our space, I struggled for quite a while to to sort out what was going on with me because when you talk to your doctor or to the doctor I had then, and when you do the initial research in in the medical literature, uh, the the outcomes look grim. Uh, Gout is something that according to them, you're gonna have your whole life. And of course the prediabetes which was my condition leads to type two diabetes and then down the road to, you know, managed care and, and the complications that come from that. Uh, And it wasn't until I found my way to the uh, ketogenic space uh, and looked at the science. I'm a PhD biochemist and also a nutrition network practitioner at this point. And Uh, So as a biochemist, when I finally found my way to the science, because I don't believe in doing anything in terms of where the medical establishment is, right, and what they expect you to do, and then what I was going to do, I felt like had to be based on science. And when you follow the ketogenic science, it it led me uh, to the ability to very quickly reverse the prediabetes uh, relative to A1C and fasting glucose, that left the question of the gout out there. And I've been in gout remission now for several years. I've been on the ketogenic, I'm in my fourth year on the ketogenic diet. And I really pounded the ground on the science of gout. Um, and um, forcing that issue led me to Dr. Richard Johnson, who I know you've interviewed on your program. Mm-hmm. And, um, and I, I uh, communicate with him uh, a, a lot at this point. Uh, I, I myself have done a couple of interviews with him. The most recent one was just a few weeks ago. And we'll probably get to some of, of what that discussion was with him because it had to do with the gout hypothesis that I believe basically comes from his work. Okay. But it is a hypothesis that 
looking at his work and then a, a variety of other disciplines. And that's that's the thing that I think you really need to take home from Dr. Johnson's work is the fact that he does not live in a hallway. He looks outside his discipline all the time for clues as to why we're suffering from these diseases. And not only did I take a lesson from him, but also my own uh, biochemistry training uh, was along those lines. Uh, in fact, I don't know of any biochemists that are worth their salt uh, who function when they look at a problem by staying within their group. Uh, in my case, as a biochemist, we look at the metabolics of a human from a ver every metabolic pathway we can lay our hands on and then try to make sense of those relationships in order to find a solution to a problem for which there's a lot of people um, suffering. So anyway, this, this is who I am. I've been devoted now for three years to myself uh, as a health coach, trying to uh, help people reverse diabetes. I work with clients and then I have a, a strong educational component. I think Judy, like you do, you know, so I, I have a vlog cast and so on a, a YouTube channel where I, I present to people um, the solutions to these issues as, as I see them. Thank you. And I'll make sure to put all your information in the show notes as well. And, you know, I listened to your presentation and it was really good and powerful um, about uric acid. And it was right before I was interviewing Dr. Richard Johnson. And it was just fate that I had heard your talk and then I was interviewing with him. But to sort of rewind a little bit, why do we get gout and what does nitrogen eating meats and uric acid and even fructose have anything to do with all of it? So to answer that question is really important to understand the establishment explanation for that. And the, their explanation is, is that when you eat certain foods, your uric acid is going to go up. And when the uric acid goes up, it's going to diffuse into, into the joints. I mean, this is the law of thermodynamics, actually. And I'm not arguing about that. It's true. Um, the uric acid in the circulatory system is going to diffuse into other organs and it's going to diffuse into the joints. Their argument is once it's in the joint, if the concentration of uric acid is high enough, then it's going to crystallize. And the crystallization, like having a splinter in your finger, is going to activate uh, the immune system. And there will be a gout flare in response to the crystallized uric acid. Th that narrative is false. One has to remember that uh, any sort of hypothesis can be falsified if you can find one example that suggests that it's not true. So where, where I started with this three years ago was just simply looking at the statistics. And you have to start with that because the clue that, that, that this way of thinking is not correct starts with the fact that we have uh, somewhere between, and, and this is going to depend on where you find this information. There's a 200 and, uh, 2011 associational study, and then we have NHANES, and we've got something around somewhere between 68 to 43 million, somewhere in that range of people walking around solely in the U.S. that are hyperuricemic and not expressing gout, not having gout flares. So that's the first clue that the fact that you can have high uric acid and not have a gout flare. And then when, when you look at what the mean concentration of uric acid is in a person who's having gout, it literally is uh, approximately uh, 8.3 mg per deciliter, which I know we're getting a little technical here, but that's the top of the reference range. It's not outside it. And when you talk to a doctor about this stuff, which I did in 2016, they're like, ah, well, your uric acid is high and that's why you're having a gout attack. And when you look at my medical records, my, my uric acid in the clinic that day was, uh, because they did the blood analysis right there, was 8.1 mg per deciliter. I literally was at the top of the reference range. I was not outside it. And then furthermore, there's two other issues here. A full 18% of gout sufferers uh, have uric acid levels that are between six and eight inside the range. And then there's a full 14% of sufferers who have uric acid concentrations that are under six, which by any argument is well within what, what the establishment considers the normal range. And then I don't want to get off track here, but I've had two gout flares 
since going on to the ketogenic diet. One of them was in the beginning. And I know the questions that you sent me, uh, we're going to address that issue. But when you go onto a ketogenic diet, and this is going to include carnivore, like if someone goes carnivore, today, they're on the standard American diet, tomorrow, they start carnivore, they're going to see uh, an acute rise in uric acid in the circulatory system. And uh, the reason for that is because they're producing very rapidly, they're going to be producing ketones and uh, acetoacetate and beta hydroxybutyrate. Both of those are, are organic acids and they're preferentially excreted by the kidneys relative to uric acid. So what that does is it backs the uric acid up because it can't get out by excretion. And you see this rise and it's during that rise that gout sufferers can be vulnerable to a gout flare when they're doing this transition onto a ketogenic type of, of lifestyle. Now, over time, what happens is, is that with all of the profound changes that are going on, uh, the uric acid is eventually going to start to come down. But it was during that acute rise, I think I was at month four, where I had a gout, gout flare. It's important to mention that because I was on a ketogenic diet, and I believe because of the, the high beta hydroxybutyrate, which has been shown in the literature to inhibit the gout flare inflammatory process, that the flare was mild. I didn't even take ibuprofen and I didn't have to stop exercising, but I knew I had an issue in the exact same toe joint of the original flare. And it was this throbbing thing and it went away after four or five days. So I didn't even have the extent, but anyway, and then the second place, and this is important to your question. Well, actually two of them, right? The first one, we can come back to the excretion thing at the kidneys, but the other, the other place where this matters is that eventually, and I hope we get to talk about this, I did make the choice to go on all all, And the reason for that was three years into this, literally, and I have, I have uh, extensive data on myself, because I finger stick for uric acid every single day before and after meals. Uh, and I've been doing that for a really long time. And one of the things the doctors will tell you is when you go on all all, you're also vulnerable to a gout flare. And I I had one. And here's the, the thing that is amazing. My uric acid concentration was 4.5 megs per deciliter. It's exactly in the range. If you talk to uh, Dr. Johnson about this and you say, well, you know, after somebody is stabilized, right, they've eliminated alcohol and fructose and, and hyperglycemia and they're no longer having gout flares. If they still are hyperuricemic and they take a uh, urate lowering drug, what's the target? And he's going to say between four and five mg per deciliter. So albeit when you go on the drug, you are vulnerable to a flare. And I had one. The interesting thing is, is that just like the first flare that I described to you, the symptoms were mild and I didn't have to take even ibuprofen and I didn't stop exercising. This seems to be a, a benefit to being on a ketogenic lifestyle, whether it's carnivore or whether you've you've ramped up the hill from that and you're eating, you know, low carb vegetables as a as a function of, of your lifestyle or not, that if you do have a gout flare, that it tends to be mild. And this is what I hear from my followers too. I'm not claiming that this is any way of a scientific study, but the majority of them say up front, well, yeah, I've still had, I'm still having some flares, but they're nothing like what I had before. So if I just listen to everything you're saying, and I suffer from gout, one of the things I may fear, though, is that, okay, so if some of the ketones that we produce inside the body, such as beta hydroxybutyrate, competes with the excretion of uric acid, and then if that, um, I guess that competition then can cause a s small gout flare, maybe the ketogenic diet isn't ideal for gout, because there are chances of flares. What are your thoughts of, you know, why are these small ish flares still happening? Is there a possibly better diet for gout other than a ketogenic diet? Yeah. So let's talk about that. The one thing that I didn't say in answer to your question, because the initial questions had many parts to them. So what is the, a valid gout hypothesis? Right. Uh, we need to understand that first. So the first thing that that gout sufferers got to understand is that 
gout is not an individualized specific type of ailment. Uh, and, and this is something that the medical establishment wants you to believe. It's like an inconvenient thing. You take an anti-inflammatory and it goes away. It's not. Um, we know that uric acid is required for a gout flare, but here, here's the distinction. What's required for the gout flare is, an, is a sudden acute rise in intracellular uric acid in a chondrocyte, which is the, the biological cell that's important inside the cartilage. And that sudden acute rise of uric acid needs to be happening inside a chondrocyte, which is suffering from chronic low-grade inflammation. So I believe that the chondrocytes are primed for this. How do they get primed for it? Because People like me, for example, I'm in my 60s and I've been eating, I was eating the standard American diet for decades and which is hyperglycemic. And then as an adult, I was, I was drinking alcohol on a regular basis along with the added sugars. So you have what's called, I call it the deadly triad. You have the alcohol, you have the fructose that's coming in from the added, added sugars, high fructose corn syrups, and you have hyperglycemia. Now, when we talk about the hyperglycemia, a lot of people don't understand because you hear out there, well, the, the glycemia doesn't have anything to do with fructose, Dr. P. What are you talking about? But it actually has everything to do with it because hyperglycemia activates the polyol pathway, which drives all of this glucose is sitting on top of glycolysis, which is a regulated pathway up to 30% of that glucose is driven to endogenous fructose. So even if somebody makes the argument, well, I don't drink alcohol and I stopped eating sugar. And although I, I know you're a coach too, and when you hear someone say I've stopped the sugar, I'm always skeptical because of how it's coming into so many places that people don't even realize, right? And then they're like, you know, but but the truth is they're not really managing the the glycemic part of the of, of the lifestyle. They're still eating rice, potatoes, you know, a lot of, a lot of high glycemic foods, uh, a, a ton of fruit. You're asking about the fruit. I used to have these massive fruit bowls in the morning. Uh, and those are driving the chronic inflammational state of the chondrocyte. And then you hit it with the deadly triad. So what do we have? We have intracellular uric acid, right? And Johnson will tell you there's a difference between intracellular uric acid and extracellular uric acid. And when we're finger sticking for uric acid, we're measuring extracellular uric acid, not what's going on inside a particular cell, whether we're talking about uh, the brain, the kidneys, or the liver, which this system we're talking about right now is heavily characterized. And we know that it's going on without, you know, there's plenty of data uh, that comes from Johnson's work and his collaborators in this area. The chondrocyte is a fuzzier area. And granted, there are things that a lot of things that need to be worked out with this. But for the gout flare, we need the, the intracellular sudden rise in the uric acid. All right. We need systemic inflammation with the formation uh, or the activation of junk one and also IL-1 beta within the chondrocyte over a threshold. Right. This is a threshold issue. And once we reach that threshold, now you have chondrocytes, which literally are sick and they go into program dying. Right. So you actually, I believe, have cell death there. And as that process happens, those cells are going to release uric acid, mono, actually monosodium urate into the synovial fluid of the joint along with IL-1 beta, which is a signaling molecule that yells at the innate immune system, hey, dudes, get over here, the macrophages and the neutrophils and potentially others. And they get together in a constellation of effects that generates the flare. This is, this is what I think. So when you're talking to some of these guys, and I've, I haven't talked to, um, I, I don't want to kill his name, Saladino, but there's a difference between somebody who's perhaps in their 30s and 40s, who has not been on the standard American diet long enough to generate the damage at the level of the pancreas and the liver and the brain and, and in the chondrocytes uh, to the point where they're, they're actually 
meeting the requirements that I just talked about. So you've got this low grade inflammation. So the chondrocytes are primed. Then you have this sudden acute rise in the uric acid, the systemic cas uh, inflammational cascade. You bring in the innate immune system and then boom, you've got your gout flare. So I think you have to think about this in the context of where you are in your metabolic health. And for people that are like me who were in there, I was 50, uh, what was I, 59, I think, when I was diagnosed with, with prediabetes. And I think, as you well know, when you pop with the numbers, any number of, of experts that we respect in this space are going to tell you, well, it, they're going to use language like it's too late. You got the damage. Now, when, they, when I say it's too late, I don't mean you're done. I mean that you have a damaged system. And you can't expect if you go carnivore or, or some other variation of that, that you're going to fix all that stuff in a month or two. Right. The likelihood of a gout flare, if you are a gout sufferer, and, and there seems to be a gradient with that too. So what I mean by that is that some people have very few flares, but they have them. And then there are other people that literally are just being racked with this, you know, every single month. I, I have followers that complain about that. So I think it depends where you are on the spectrum and understanding that if you're a gout sufferer, you got to look at the associational data. The likelihood that you are um, not obese is really slim. The, the possibility that you also have kidney disease is quite high. 75, 74% of gout sufferers uh, also have different levels of kidney disease, like stage two or stage three, apparently. Uh, a full quarter of them are type two diabetics. And then somewhere around 14 or 15% are also suffering from cardiovascular disease. So that's the reality of somebody who's my age. So I'm not saying that Saladino is incorrect, but I'm saying that one has to take a very, uh, if you suffer from gout, and this is what I did, you need to step back and go, okay, this is probably not the only issue associated with my health right now. There's probably other factors that took the five or six decades I was eating this way to get to this point. And now getting out of this situation and getting healthy again is going to take time. And I think when you look at the gout, the deadly triad is by far, it's not, these are not, these three things are not the only things that can cause gout, but they stand out you know, with Christmas lights around them, the alcohol, uh, the, the sugar issue, you know, the high fructose corn syrup, agave syrup, yada, 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 processed food issue. And hyperglycemia is a really big deal. And then when you, you package in these other things that come with that triad, the high salt that's probably there, um, you've got the hypoxic environment of the, of the synovial fluid in the joint. And those things I believe are causing uh, to a high degree, the probability that you're going to have a gout flare. A quick, quick question. I know that the intracellular versus the extracellular, that part of the, I guess, uric acid is not fully vetted, but from everything you just mentioned, if we were to say, so going on a ketogenic diet, yes, some of the uric acid is no longer excreted. And so that can cause some of the flare because um, it's being competed with some of the ketones, but the allopurinol, my assumption is that it lowers your um, extracellular uric acid levels. Uh, and that's why we can measure it and it looks lower. So is it that because all of a sudden there's this downshift of uric acid in our outside of the cells that like, what is the trigger then that within the cell that it still causes a, a slight, I guess, gout flare, like I'm, I'm missing that link of when we lower the extra, is it that some of that then goes into the inside of the cell and that's what causes a flare? What's, do you know what I'm saying? Oh yeah, absolutely. Um, and that there's actually three, at least three questions in that. So the first thing is when you go on a carnivore or you go on the ketogenic diet, the reason why I think this is a valid approach is because you lower the systemic inflammation, right. bang, right out the window. So you deprime the chondrocyte. You also lower systemic inflammation in, in the biggest target organ where uric acid metabolism is happening. Well, that could be an overstatement, but in the liver. 
and also in the brain. This is a really big deal for the brain. And in the proximal tubules of the kidney, the, the kidney uh, metabolizes fructose and so does the brain. And they do this in a big way. So allopurinol coming back to that. And I think this is relative to the question you're asking me about uric acid fluctuations. Uric acid targets, its main target area is the liver. And it is downregulating ex exanthine oxidase, which technically I think is ox exanthine dehydrogenase, I, exanthine oxidase. And it's being downregulated. The main effect of that is in the liver. Although I, I think it's probably operating on other organs to getting, getting in and operating on the same enzyme. And the net result is that now in the liver, you're going to produce less uric acid and less uric acid means that the liver is going to be transporting less of it out into the circulatory system. Now I believe, and I don't have data for this, but I've discussed it with Johnson quite a bit. And I believe that what's instrumental in initiating the gout flare is the sudden fluctuations in uric acid within the joint. So as you pointed out, if we go with the model, just very quickly of, okay, I've taken all of purinol, it's, it's lowered my uric acid uh, production in the liver. So now there's less of it going out into the circulatory system. What, what that means to the joint, because this is something that I forgot to mention earlier, but if you look at the 68 million, 40 to 43 million hyperuricemic uh, people in the U.S. and you literally stick a needle in there uh, in a knee joint and aspirate fluid or in the toe joint, uh, you're going to find uh, sodium urate crystals. You're going to find them there. And, and this is a really important piece of data because it means that just having the crystal, no, it can't be the reason why people are getting gout. Because if that was the case, we wouldn't be talking about eight or 9 million people in the U.S. with gout. We'd be talking about between 68 to 43, 43 million people of them, if it was a, the crystal. So, and Johnson and I talked about this issue. So um, I think that there's an intimate relationship between the amount of monosodium urate, which is exiting a chondrocyte into the synovial fluid, and then the relationship, and this is getting into the chemistry stuff, the relationship between that extracellular uric acid, which is in the synovial fluid and the crystal, the crystalline sodium urate that is housed there and that there's this dynamic between them. Like when you get into the biophysics of this, and I, I'm not going to go there here, but when you look at the biophysics of the crystal, it, it easy, easily fl should fluctuate between the crystalline form and the soluble form of uric acid. So if you lower the uric acid in the circulatory system, then the crystalline uric acid that is in the joint will respond to that because of the laws of diffusion. If you see the, the concentration of, of monosodium urate starting to go down in the circulatory system, some of the crystal is going to solubilize and uric acid is, gonna, is going to uh, move out into the circulatory system. And I believe it's that dynamic right there. You can bring this constellation of issues together and have the gout flare. Um, and, and that implies, and again, this is a hypothesis, that implies that, that crystalline uric acid is not the main player here, but there is some kind of relationship between soluble uric acid and crystalline uric acid and what's going on with the health of the chondrocyte, because you alluded to this, uric acid can freely move from the synovial fluid into the chondrocyte and out of the chondrocyte. Also, uh, in and out of the, of the circulatory system. And there's data for that. Here's what I mean by that. There's data that shows that uric acid can move into and out of the joint going back into the mid 1900s. The, the biophysics that these guys used to do is extraordinary and pretty much overlooked in 2022, except for people like Johnson, right? That's what I meant. He goes out of his hallway right. to try and understand things. And then one other thing I'll say, and then turn this back to you, is that there are two studies, one out of Thailand and one out of, uh, I think it was out of China, either that or India, I don't remember off the top of my head now, who have preliminary data that shows 
that in a gout sufferer, the concentration of uric acid in the synovial fluid is higher than the circulatory system. Mm -hmm. And they did not find this when they compared it to individuals that were osteoarthritic and to individuals that were uh, had rheumatoid arthritis. In the case of the of the osteoarthritis people and the rheumatoid people, the concentration of uric acid in their joints was what you expect for a simple diffusion model between what's going on in the circulatory system and what's going on in the joint. In the gout sufferers, the concentration of uric acid was higher than the circulatory system. And that implies that there is a production issue going on in the gout sufferer that is distinct from somebody with osteoarthritis or rheumatoid arthritis, right? This goes to the question that you were asking. So there's some kind of dynamic that is going on there that is more complicated than this idea that, okay, uric acid is just moving into the joint, it crystallizes, now you have the sliver in your toe and boom, gout flare. So just lowering uric acid does not necessarily make gout people happy. And during the dynamic, during this shift, when you're bringing the uric acid down and it's it's rapidly shifting, and I, I've been on allopurinol, off allopurinol, and back on it. And during these transitions and still today, I'm finger sticking for uric acid all the time. Start with fasting in the morning, before and after meals, mid-afternoons. And why am I tracking this? Because I went on allopurinol and I wanted to see how my uric acid was responding to that. And then do I have a flare or not? The second time I went onto uric acid, or excuse me, onto allopurinol, I, I, I did not have a flare. Is there an easy way to track or test for the uric acid in the synovial fluid? So if we know that there's something in the intracellular part of uric acid that may cause more of the gout flare? Is there a way to measure that so that we are not just measuring the extracellular that may not be the ultimate, you know, sense of what's going on with gout? There's not an easy way to do it. And what, okay, so if you ask one of the two uh, research groups that did that, they would say, well, of course, it's easy, you just stick a needle in somebody's joint and (laughs) pull some (laughs) synovial fluid out. And then you know, uh, analyze it for uric acid. So from that point of view, yeah, it's really easy, but there is no, there's no easy way for, for a common person like myself to, to do that experiment. So the best we can do is like glucose or ketone monitoring, you know, we have to like uh, finger stick. And, And then as you point out, we're getting extracellular uric acid and that's a caveat or a problem when you're trying to like sort this needle in a haystack out no pun intended. (laughs) So there, you know, you just talked about the triad of hyperglycemia. So let's say on a, you know, making this more applicable to the ketogenic and carnivore world, let's say I reduce all carbohydrates. And so there, I will lower a lot of that hyperglycemia. I know that people are going to think, well, my blood sugar has gone up on carnivore, but I think it's a whole different ballpark than us saying our blood sugar is high. Our insulin's high because of eating a lot of sugary foods or carbohydrate rich foods. So let's say we minimize that. And then we also stop drinking alcohol. So then all that's left is really fructose. And most people on a carnivore diet, they're not eating high fructose corn syrup. They're not eating, drinking the sodas. They're not drinking the orange juice, but maybe some of them are starting to add back some of the fruits because they feel a little bit more energy and they feel a little better with a little bit of carbohydrates. Do you think eating just meats and maybe having some fruits, and I'm sure there's a limit, but that that can cause um, some of the gout flares that you've just talked about? So again, I think to really to understand that everyone who's interested in in eating the way that you're suggesting uh, to put gout in remission, I believe they can do it. I think that this is a really good way to go if you want to put gout in remission, uh, the lifestyle that we're that we're sharing here, you know. But I think timing matters. This is my personal opinion. So like if you're like I was, you're just cranking on the standard American diet. You you know, every night almost 4 years ago, you know, it was 4 years ago actually, yeah. 
my plate, you know, had a mound of potatoes or rice on it. And I was using sauces that had high fructose corn syrup in them and didn't even realize it. I was drinking three beers every single night. And then I was having these massive fruit bowls. I was your pretty much standard American person eating a standard American diet who thought I was eating a healthy diet. And I passed off the whole alcohol thing is going, okay, well, I'm exercising every day anyway. I'm just working it off, right? That was my argument. When I discovered, you know, my mistakes, that I was wrong all along, right? Um, and I went on to the ketogenic diet. It, it was a very black and white thing for me. I mean, one day I was standard American, the next day, boom, my wife was like, what's going on? You know, <laughs> um, and at that point, I think, to answer your question more fully, a person really needs to be honest with themselves about where they're at, you know, and, and I knew from the pre-diabetic diet data and what my, you know, uh, I started doing, uh, you know, real blood work, not, not the stuff the doctor was asking for, right. Just a couple of, of markers, right. I, I was going hog wild on that. And I, I still do. I reckon recommend to my um, clients, I have 16, a minimum 16 things, and I looked at all that stuff and I could see that I was not healthy metabolically. Now, I think, uh, and this seems to be the trend in our space, that coaches tend at this point, like I don't know if you've ever um, interviewed Tanza Mur Murphy from Nutrition Network, but she would be worth an interview because I think she's the best low-carb nutritionist in the world. Um, and I say that not to diss anyone else, but she's connected in, in a research environment. So she's working directly with doctors uh, in the nutri nutrition network as a function, as a team function on these people. And they have a lot of data. And what they're doing is they're taking people carnivore right out of the gate for, for any of this stuff. And again, I, I believe the gout issue and type two diabetes, obesity, cardiovascular disease, we all have the same central issue that's driving this. We just have a different global set of genetics, you know, with the epigenetics and all that business that we, we show the ramifications of that lifestyle in, in it with a different constellation overall. And, uh, and so they bring these people to a carnivore state right out of the gate. And then what they do is slowly bring them, bring them back to where they want to be. So if this individual wants to eat fruit at some point in this transition, right, they can start bringing back some using common sense, right? No more big mango fruit bowls in the morning with low fat yogurt, you know, and the smoothie and all that business, right? No, thinking about, all right, I'm going to have some fruit. I'm not going to overdo it. I'm going to choose one that's low for sweetness it has a lot of fiber in it. And I'm going to try some of that. Remember what I said, I believe there's a lag period here, mm -hmm. where you're not going to be doing that. And what are you going to be doing? You're going to be monitoring your biomarkers. Like, you know, I, I, I in myself, I monitor my weight, my blood pressure, my glucose and my ketones, my uric acid. And these days, with the fitness thing, I'm also monitoring lactate in a lot of different contexts. And you were asking about the alcohol thing a minute ago. Well, it will blow your mind. Have a couple of drinks, a couple of glasses of wine and finger stick for lactate and see what happens. Because <laughs> it's going to go up by a lot. It's going to look to you like you are actually exercising. Now, I don't want to get off on a, on a tangent here, but I believe all these things are related. So, you, you know, I and I think even with my own clients now, it's a difficult argument to get them to want to go carnivore, right? For most of the people that I work with, they're like, I have to give this up and I have to give that up. All right. Can we just go to a plate method where you're going to have some protein and two low carb uh, keto approved vegetables? Let's just start there. Right. But then I try to hold them to that for a long time until we can see that their metabolic condition is actually, you know, has improved. Right. And then maybe, maybe if they're inquiring, I'd like to do some fruit, then, you know, we have a valid discussion about that. Yeah. Okay. Well, can you be careful? Like, don't go out and eat three yellow mangoes back to back. 
or have a, a crap ton of, of watermelon or something, right? It's like you, uh, Lustig and, and Johnson have talked about this. Treat it like a dessert and don't overdo it. I think that's really good. I think where it gets a little nuanced is people always want the number, right? So when when I shared the interview with Dr. Johnson, the question is, well, how much fruit can I have? How many grams of fructose is allowed in a day that's safe? And I know from our conversation, it depends. It depends on our metabolic health, our age yeah. and all of that. But if there was a range or, you know, how much can a fructose can our livers tolerate, for example, um, would you say that there is a range? Uh, one thing I'll say is, the example I've always heard is maybe 20 grams of fructose a day. Well, mangoes, for example, have 30 something for one mango. So does that mean that's off the limits? And I know, again, it's very nuanced, but what are your thoughts about, you know, what is allowed in terms of fructose in a day, if you want to, I guess, put your gout or your hyperuricemia into remission? So I think you're absolutely right what you're implying is that there's a threshold. And the problem is even with uh, Johnson's work is that we don't know what the threshold is. I, uh, I fully admit that we don't know what it is. And more than likely, it's a bell curve for humans, right? There's going to be some people. In fact, I think there are some people who are super sensitive to what he calls this survival switch, you know, um, and there are other people that are significantly you know, not that sensitive to it. I, and, and I know you encounter these guys uh, out there, uh, not just guys, but women too. They're super lean. It seems like they can eat anything that they want. Um, when you're trying to, to have a discussion with them, they're like, no, the only thing that matters is how many calories I'm eating and then whether I'm working out enough. And I think that those guys collectively um, are, are suffering from the following idea. And that idea is, is that we fall on this continuum with this threshold. Not everybody's the same. And some people seem to be very resistant to this uric acid effect. And so, you know, I think I mainly am working with people that have metabolic health problems. And specifically, my clients, most of them are uh, serious type 2 diabetics. So in this case, I believe that in the beginning, we just, they should not eat the eat fruit or any of it because we need to like get them healthy. Right. And then we can talk about bringing, if they want, if they still feel like they need some fruit or whatever, we can talk about, okay, how can we do this in a realistic manner? And coming back to, to a conversation I had with Johnson, we need to remember that in the lifestyle that we're talking about, that we have really significantly lowered the systemic inflammation issue. Uh, that's one of the driving factors of, of these metabolic diseases, right? Of, with the mitochondrial dysfunction. So if we've repaired a lot of that and, and these guys are not just uh, eating differently and they've, they've got the exercise component coming in, they've, they've, you know, they're, they're dealing with the stress in their life, they're managing their sleep better, then perhaps they can start in a very common sense way, bringing some fruit back in. I mean, I will acknowledge to the crowd that is listening to this right now that I, I've been experimenting bringing carbs back into my own life. What can I eat? Uh, what kind of effect does it have on my blood glucose? And, and that's one thing, I don't know where you fall on this, but I really believe in biomarker monitoring. I And I know there's a lot of, there can be a lot of pushback against this, uh, doing this. It's like, well, that just adds stress. Okay, whatever. You, you're you metabolically unhealthy. We've decided, uh, I'll talk about myself. I've decided that I'm going to do something about this. How do I know if this is actually working? How do I know if I can have some mango? Well, monitor your biomarkers, your glucose before and after you've had some of that mango and look and see what the consequences are of it because they're going to be. So consequences there, look and see where your ketones are, you know, and for me also, what is the uric acid issue? Uh, is there one, you know, I'll give you an example. I've also been playing around with exogenous ketones. People have been asking me about this. Dr. Pete, you said that beta hydroxybutyrate inhibits the inflammatory process that it causes gout, a gout flare. Yes, that's true. Can I take an exogenous ketone, like from ketone aid? What does it do to my uric acid? 
Is the uric acid going up in a dysfunctional way? Like what's the peak? Well, I got some of that stuff and I'm not just going to eat it and then go willy nilly down the sidewalk, right? I'm going to test and, I ha- and I'm in the process of doing all that right now and see what are the consequences of, of that, you know? And so these people that you're talking about that want to have some fruit, one, I think they've got to give the lifestyle time. They need to look and see, am I improving? Do I feel better? Is my health better? Am I taking care of these other things? All right, I'm going to try a fruit. So what's the big deal about tr- maybe having an orange or something? I think I you probably know what the fructose is and that I don't off the top of my head, but maybe I'll try an orange. And so I, I'm going to test my glucose, my ketones and my uric acid before I eat it. And then I'm going to test my all of those things again at 30 minutes, one hour and two hours, and maybe even at three and four hours. And, you know, I'm going to have some data. And at that point I can go, geez, there's hardly really any effect there. So I probably can have an orange. Now that doesn't mean I'm going to run out and get a bag of oranges. <laughs> right, right. And, you know, um, so just explaining a little bit about my carnivore cure elimination protocol. So I follow a lot of the things that you just brought up. I believe that everyone should try a meat only if they can handle it for many reasons. It could be because of addictive issues with just maybe going all in that carbs are not on the table that can help. But also if you struggle with any type of metabolic syndrome, um, autoimmune, you can figure out where if you just leave in meat where you can focus on, okay, so food is not causing inflammation in the body. It's not irritating me because I'm eating something that's foreign that my immune system needs to fight back against. So if we just find the meats that we can settle with, and then as we heal, if people want to reintroduce, that's part of the reintroduction of foods and doing it in a safe manner. And there's like a food and mood journal you can use to just realize how are these things affecting me? I totally believe in measuring biomarkers uh, that it gets a little tricky though. So I think it's not the only thing. So for example, if we're looking at fructose, well, if you use a CGM or a glucose monitors, it's mainly tracking the glucose. So we don't see a portion of what the fructose is doing. And so if you eat a mango, I suspect because mango is more fructose than glucose, you'll get some of the, the, I guess the switch from the glucose monitor, but you're not going to see how much it's affecting you from a fructose perspective. And so that's the part where I think the biofeedback in that sense um, is not as powerful as say, maybe you track your mood. So how is your energy? Do you all of a sudden have a really big spike and then your mood kind of crashes? Do you feel like you're craving sugar? How is your sleep after that? And so I think it's a collection of things that people should track. So the biofeedback is super important, but also the symptoms. I, I really think our bodies are really good at telling us if we choose to remove a lot of the noise. And if you eat just meat only, you're able to start tracking. Oh, that's weird. Now I'm all of a sudden having hives and maybe that's a history mean response, or you're having loose stools, and maybe you had too much salt, there's little things that our body's telling us, I wasn't okay with that. And so I I think everything you said is good. I'd say that maybe also to add our system, our symptoms, because our own innate wisdom, I really just like how we have a gout flare, it's essentially telling us that something we're doing in our body is not happy. And so there's a response. Um, So I think all of that's good. Uh, But one thing I wanted to ask you is, let's say we remove fructose, we remove alcohol, the other big component is purines. And that's where, you know, that is the breakdown of the DNA products from meats and other foods we eat. And so that's where a lot of the traditional or standard care doctors will say, you have to remove red meat because it's high in purines. Well, when when I did the data, and I talked to Dr. Richard Johnson about this, is that if you look at the numbers, red meat is not that high in purines. But if you look at organ meats, it's very high in purines and same thing. uh, One thing he brought up was also sardines and um, other very just really dense DNA foods. Do you think that if we were to eat a carnivore diet and let's say, and I'm sure this is, it depends, but uh, let's say we remove all the fructose or majority of it, and then we don't drink any alcohol, but we keep in organ meats and maybe we have a couple ounces a day. Do you think that load of purines itself can cause us to have a gout flare or consistently still not allow gout to get into remission? I I have had um, quite a few discussions with different experts in this area, like Sives and Johnson. And, you know, the thing, uh, I don't think, 
Okay, this is this is my opinion. When you okay. look at all of the data overall, when you look at the evolutionary, uh, you know, how humans evolved and whatnot, I know there's a lot of arguments about various aspects of that. But meat has been part of our existence from, you know, the time we went, left the, the trees and started to um, decrease the amount of fruit we were eating for millennia, right? So I have a hard time with the argument. So remember where the piecemeal approach to the gout thing came from. And what I mean by piecemeal is like, okay, don't eat the sardines, don't eat the organ meat, uh, don't eat the anchovies. Where that came from was the standard hypothesis of gout. Uric acid goes up, crystallizes in the joint, gout flare. And again, that hypothesis can't be correct. So when I think about my own journey here, uh, I've come to the conclusion that the, the protein per se is not dangerous with this. What do I think about organ meats? Well, I eat them, but on this day, so to speak, I am not eating them every single day, right? So I think, yes, you can have organ meats. Do you want to eat them every day? I don't think you do want to eat them every day. It is the role of protein, a primary driver of gout. And I believe the answer to that is no, it is secondary to the deadly triad, literally. And to come back to Johnson's work, I think it's clear cut that we're talking about sudden acute rises within a particular cell of a particular organ that is pushing the cellular network in that organ that is already chronically inflamed over a threshold. And, and eating a high protein diet, again, that we're using common sense about, I, I don't believe is causing a sudden acute rise. We've, we've already lowered the systemic inflammation going carnivore. That's a number one. You've already accomplished that. You don't, you no longer, I, I mean, think about it. Fatty liver disease reverses, the di diabetes reverses, the, the, inf the obesity, if they're, if they're compliant, is reversing cardiovascular, all the markers in cardiovascular disease improve. My gout situation went into remission. You have all that going on. So the systemic inflammation in the brain, the liver, and the kidney is definitely improving, right? And then you have this protein diet. And I, I honestly think the only way you can get into trouble with it is if you're overeating a particular aspect of it. And I think that that would be true, though, in any context, if we're overeating the carbohydrates, that's going to put us in, into a right. problem. If we're overeating, like, this is what I said to one of my followers, you know, uh, who, who is very defensive about anchovies. And I'm like, I don't think having an anchovy, a few anchovies is a problem. I've actually done, you, you, you mentioned before about not being able to measure fructose, but you can measure uric acid. Right. And and you can track sudden acute rises because it's going to come out of the liver right away, um, pretty pretty fast. But in any case, I've I've looked at the effect of anchovies on myself. Am I going to eat them every day? And what I told this guy was, I said because he uh, this individual on my channel had already uh, in a it's not it was uh, it was a public comment, so I don't have to worry about confidentiality. But if you're sitting down every day and you're eating a a crap load of anchovies along with a bunch of beer, well, you're probably going to have a gout flare. <laughs> right. And I, I think the logic is makes sense to me when you're saying that it's not that hyperuricemia equals gout. I mean, it could be a tell sign, but that doesn't mean that if you have hyperuricemia that you have gout, we have like the 30 million excess people that are that have hyperuricemia that don't have gout. So I get why maybe eating just excess purines is not that big of a deal. If you assume that the alcohol and the fructose um, aren't present in the diet. What I will tell you is that um, I do have some clients uh, that do not eat any fruit. And I believe it um, just from their other markers, like their insulin is very low and their A1C is um, healed over the years, but they actually still do get gout flares. And the only difference was that they still kept in maybe some of the sardines, but they kept in organs. I'll give you an example of one client, his, I think it was his endocrinologist, or maybe his rheumatologist had him take a certain supplement. And when I looked into the supplements, one of them were glandulars, they were organs. 
And, um, but he was still getting gout flares on a carnivore diet, even though he had been carnivore for about one to two years. And I made sure, are you having any fruit? Are you drinking alcohol? And none of those above were in fact happening. And he might just be an anomaly, right? So maybe not everyone will get still have gout flares with eating organs. But for him, it seems like it was the case. So he stopped taking those organ supplements. And I don't think he's had a gout flare since. So I, I really think the spectrum is broad. Um, I do yes. believe that, but I do mm-hmm. think there was another person I interviewed not too long ago, and he was consuming teas that had theobromine in it. And th- that is very high in purines as well. I think it's even higher than organ meats. And he said that he started noticing um, the joint pain. And so he stopped drinking that particular tea. And then his theobromine, I think it reduced. And so he didn't notice any more gout. So, and again, both of those are just purine focused. And maybe they, again, they're anomalies, but I do think there is a small population of people that may still get affected. And again, we don't know all their details of their metabolic health, but that's just something to consider that um, I have seen a few people that removing alcohol and fructose and all that, and still doing carnivore, if they eat certain high purine foods that they, it can trigger a flare. I agree with you. Um, I think there's a continuum here. And some of the, some of the followers I have on my YouTube channel seem to have, you know, I I think I mentioned this, uh, they're having gout flares repeatedly every single month. And there are more causes for gout than, than I believe just the sugar the alcohol and the hyperglycemia. There's no question about that. In fact, I've uh, been communicating with a doctor in Israel who has argued that extensively with me to the point where I believe it. In, in this conversation with you today, I'm not suggesting that uh, gout remission of uh, going into a ketogenic lifestyle is a silver bullet. I know that it's working for uh, a, a lot of people out there. I know that it's not working for some. I, I think this is a complex issue. Right. And maybe for those guys, maybe there's a different eating plan. You know, this certainly I don't think is the cat's meow. I, I'm not arguing that this is the only way to, to do it. I think a person has to really look at their, to look at their condition. Sure. What I do believe about what we're talking about is I, I believe that our hypothesis is more correct. Right. And, and with that, it, it should allow us to make better decisions about what our lifestyle is going to look like, you know, um, relative to just going, all right, uh, here's a whole list of foods that you shouldn't eat. Well, why shouldn't you eat them? Well, that whole, the whole basis of that, uh, that theorem is on this idea that, you know, the monosodium is just crystallizing in the joint and that's causing the gout. And it's just, that's just not true. Right. So yeah, I, I'm not surprised to hear you say that. Certainly some of my followers are are echoing that too. And I wonder, I wonder about them. I wonder about this lifestyle. I constantly am asking questions about this. I don't believe that I have all the answers. And obviously, and I had this conversation with Johnson about the hypothesis that we're talking about. And he said two things. He validated it. Number one, it's a better way of thinking about how gout can happen. And number two, it's testable. And we're talking about that now between him and I, because he's got the laboratory and whatnot, and you can, you can um, inhibit uh, fructose metabolism and chondrocytes and then see what happens. There's a lot of questions here. Absolutely. Is this hypothesis going to change? Yeah, for sure. Right. When I were, was talking with Dr. Um, Johnson, I basically made a decision tree that if you have hyperuricemia, here's all the things that you could do. And I think this really goes along with what you're saying. I do believe that a ketogenic carnivore diet is the best answer for, I think, all illness, to be honest. But if you suffer from gout, and this was part of the decision tree, and I'll link that in our show notes, but if you suffer from gout and you go ketogenic, and let's say you're still having it, then I would start considering reducing all fructose. It doesn't matter if it's an apple, it's all yeah. fructose should be removed. And then from there, obviously the alcohol too, because both fructose and alcohol break down in the same way. From there, if you're still getting uh, uric acid or if you're getting gout flares, but they're not as intense, 
we're, you're probably on the right track and obviously test all the markers you had mentioned, like glucose, um, your ketones, as well as your uric acid markers every day. But from there, if you're still having it, that's where I would look into the purine content. Now, not everyone, like you said, will ever need to do that. So for you, you can have liver or organ meats and you're not having the, the, the gout flare. So for you, your kind of story ends there and you don't have to look at any more nuance, but for the people that still are struggling from there, I think it would make sense to start looking at, okay, and there are lists out, um, where you look at what foods have the most purines, and then maybe you start eating the lower purine content foods to see if that will be another lever you can use within this diet to then see, okay, so if I don't eat any organ meats, I don't eat any sardines and maybe some of the salmon roe. If I reduce all the higher purine content of meats, then will I not get gout flares? And I think that may be, and then also, and then we would also have to think about MSG and salt and those other factors as well. But I think those are the big ones to consider. And my guess is that most people will no longer have gout flares. I, but- I, I totally agree with you because I don't have any clients right now um, who are suffering from okay. gout. So for, for me to have that, the conversation uh, with them that you just brought up w- with the followers that I have, I, I basically echo exactly what you're saying, okay. right? You got to start at point A and then we get down here to point B, what is the situation? And then we move from there, right? Uh, make rational decisions and maybe bringing the organ meats down, you know, and then even meat, meats that are not organ based, mm-hmm. I'm finger sticking for everything. Mm-hmm that meat wise that I'm eating and you know, how someone responds, for example, to pork might be different than uh, they respond to steak, for example, uh, or beef, you know, ground meats, right? Maybe there's a, so I, I agree with you. There is a lot of nuances here and a person just needs to like, I believe they need to be systematic and um, pragmatic about it. And just take one step at a time and and see what happens. I have a question because I I know you mentioned when we're in person that a cured meat sort of can be a trigger. And I wanted to ask you, do you think there's something about the salt level and cured meats as well as if some of the crystals are monosodium, I know Johnson and I, we didn't really delve into this much, but he thinks that also the MSG ish, the glutamate rich foods like shrimp, for example, can also be a bit of a trigger. Any for thoughts sure. on this? <laughs> yeah, no, it, it, it is a trigger. Okay. Um, and if you push him and uh, ask him to talk about the pathway that that happens, uh, he's going to, he's going to echo or he's going to, they have data for it. Okay. So what happens is, is the glutamate, I actually made notes on this because I don't want to get it wrong, but the glutamate that comes in on the MSG gets converted to glutamine. Mm-hmm. And then that gets converted to inosine monophosphate. And a lot of these food processors are um, using inosine monophosphate as an example, and even adenosine monophosphate, because they have similar uh, flavoring tendencies to MSG, right? To bring in that savory taste. The problem with glutamate, IMP and AMP is that they cut into the uric acid producing pathway underneath fructose. So you're actually activating the same pathway and you're doing it more efficiently because you're pulling in underneath the fructose and you're generating this sudden acute rise in uric acid. So yeah, and this is why going back to the standard American diet that with the deadly triad, right? Um, it, when I think back to the meal, I, I've had years to think about this. What was the meal I had? Sure. What exactly did I eat before that 2016 gout flare? Because that thing was debilitating. I, I almost fell on my face when I got out of bed, right? And I'm going what has happened to me? You know, I thought I started thinking I'm standing there holding my foot in the air and I'm, I'm thinking, did I stub my toe last night? Did I fall down when I was working out and break my foot? I could, I had no idea what was going on. And um, when I analyzed that meal uh, for sure, the MSG was there along with a, the, a hyperglycemic event with all the rice that I had, I had three beers and um, I had high purine, uh, meats, you know, it was sushi, and I had a lot of it. Um, and then I went to the back room and sat on my bed with my wife, and we were watching TV, right? And I ate a half of one of these large, it said dark chocolate on it, you know, but on the back, when you read the ingredients, it had tons of, uh, you guessed it, sugar, 
right? So the glucose and the fructose. And the next morning, I almost fell on my face with a gout attack. All right, all that stuff was there. So yeah, I think cured meats can be a problem. Like, but that doesn't mean that I don't eat right. um, sausage or salamis. Uh, I just get the uncured versions, and I I pay a lot of attention to the ingredient list. Um, and I'm always looking for sugar under one gram, you know, or carbs under one gram total carbs per serving. And that's how I I base on what I do, you know. So yeah, the MSG is a big deal, and then. The food manufacturers have tried to get around this because they know MSG has a bad rap. Right. So what are they doing? They're using IMP, inosine monophosphate, and adenosine monophosphate because they know in the ingredient list that that's not going to trigger um, a reaction by somebody, right? They're, they're just going to look right past that. Sure. But all three things have exactly the same effect. You also mentioned stearic acid, that stearic acid can also be a trigger. Can you talk a little bit about that? So again, in this hypothesis, you know, there's a lot we don't know. It's a hypothesis and I don't have a lab. I don't have any data for this. I just had, I've spent hundreds of hours with my nose in different research papers. What some of these labs are progressively really focusing on is how we get to that inflammatory response. And there's a paper now, shoot, I should have looked them up again this morning. Justin, J-O-O-S-T-N was the lead author on it. And, uh, and they were able to show that n- number one, the inflammasome, right, this complex of proteins that you can think of as the hammer that is that is generating, the, you know, overall the flare, the heat, the pain, all of that stuff. Uh, the, the main culprit seems to be the NLRP3 inflammasome. But the Justin paper is very interesting, because they have solid data that implies that there are other inflammasomes besides NLRP3 that are in, that can be involved in this. And they, and they showed definitive data that steric acid was involved, I believe in the initiation of this inflammasome. And, uh, and I have believed from the beginning that uh, it's likely there are going to be other Uh, priming and initiating molecules besides steric acid. And when you think about steric acid and you look at the hyperglycemic event of the, um, of the standard American diet, one area that you might look at is the osteoarthritis data. Um, These guys have published hundreds of papers and they know that hyper, the hyperglycemia of the uh, standard American diet is really problematic for the chondrocytes. It's causing this low-grade inflammation. And when you look at what are the primary, some of the primary fatty acids that get produced during de novo lipogenesis, steric acid is one of them. And, uh, but there's holes here. And one of the holes is when you look at the osteoarthritis data is that And this is, I I talked to Johnson about this extensively, is that they're doing all this stuff with hyperglycemia and not only one research group, one, looked at whether or not the polyol pathway was being activated in the polyol, in the um, chondrocyte. And in fact, it is. So that's what's led me to believe, all right, so coming back to your question, steric acid, right? We know at least based on one paper that polyol is being activated. I think there's going to be a lot of really interesting pieces to this. The gout condition, it has been vastly oversimplified. I've, I keep coming back to this, but it's, it's like the cardiovascular story, right? Those guys found cholesterol in plaques. And so cholesterol must be causing heart disease. So you find a crystal of monosodium urate in the joint of somebody who's hyperuricemic and you're going, watch out, you're probably going to get gout. And it's like, no, it's not that simple. You need, you need this um, orchestra of different, uh, you need the innate immune system. You need uh, this programming going on in the chondrocyte. We know, for example, that de novo lipogenesis is happening in the chondrocyte. And think about this, if that's going on, chronically, as these people are eating five to six standard American meals every single day, and you're overproducing lipids, right? We need lipids in our joints. But if we're overproducing certain types and whatnot, I mean, it starts to be really clear uh, why we're getting into trouble with this. Right. A lot of people that are on a carnivore diet, um, because 
we are naturally oftentimes with intermittent fasting, sometimes extended fasting will be in a ketogenic state. So most people will have ketones. And so we just discussed that when we have ketones in our body, we, it will be competing with uric acid. Amber O'Hearn wrote like a piece where she talked about how high ketones and then high uric acid can be protective. You talked about how it can stop some of that inflammation from uric acid. I have hyperuricemia. So after I talked with Dr. Johnson, I checked and my markers range from like six to sometimes nine. And he wasn't as worried because my ketones are relatively high and I don't eat any fruit. Um, I never eat organs, but I do eat sardines sometimes, but I just want to make sure that people listening to this don't worry that they have hyperuricemia if they don't have gout. And if they're in a ketogenic state that there are some thoughts that it can be a protective mechanism that our uric acid is high and that it's not something we need to necessarily reduce if we have hyperuricemia on a ketogenic diet, if all our other metabolic markers are in good standing. Yes, I know the controversy here. Um, And it is a controversy because we know that extracellular uric acid uh, is important to us. I mean, we evolved to do this, to have it. And the argument is in the extracellular environment that it's an antioxidant. And, but the question that I had, uh, or that I have for Johnson, I also talked with Cybus extensively about this, um, was the question I asked is what is the threshold? Do you know how much is too much? And what is it doing? And you know what? The answer is, this is a very exciting area of research because there needs to be a lot more of it, right? What What is, at what point does somebody say, okay, I'm not comfortable with my hyperuricemia? Right. Because when you talk to some of these doctors, they're like, uh, you know, this is, a, this is a predictor of cardiovascular disease. Uh, definitely you want to lower it. And then you talk to some of these other guys and they're going, no, don't lower it. That's Sivas's point of view. He's like, I have plenty of clients that are, that are in the area of, uh, that are on average men that are on average seven megs per deciliter. And then as you just described for yourself, it's going up and down, you know, depending on the day and what they're eating and there's circadian rhythms involved in this and a lot of different things. So what should somebody do about this? Uh, one, one thing to keep in mind is that in the early 1900s, the average uh, uric acid for men was between three and 3.5. Now, you know, uh, and I tracked mine. Oh, I still track it, but I kept really solid data. And this is something that you should keep in mind. And what I have found uh, talking to, uh, because I've convinced some of my type two diabetes to, uh, people to um, measure uric acid as they become ketogenic and get past keto adaption for many of these people, and they lose a bunch of weight, their uric acid comes down into the middle of the reference range. Um, you could interview Tia, Tia Reed, for example, who's also associated with the nutrition network, who openly talks about this. Okay. Um, she would be a great interviewee because not only did she reverse diabetes, uh, her and her gout came into remission, but her uric acid is without medication has dropped down into the range between four and five mm-hmm. makes per deciliter. So I think that there's a certain group of people that once they go ketogenic and they're keto adapted, you know, whatever that is long enough for some of us, it's much longer than a few months. For some people, it's a couple of months, whatever, but you establish between you and your coach, okay, I'm keto adapted. And they see the uric acid come well down in, into the reference range. In my case, I did not. My uric acid was the same as what Sivas described for many of the men that he works with. It was between seven and eight. And like you described, uh, sometimes up around eight or excuse me, nine or 10. And if I would have hard alcohol, I've, I've done so much end wanting. I, I could have uric, I've had seen uric acid in myself uh, after uh, two drinks of gin, you know, one shot of gin per drink uh, north of 12 megs per deciliter wow. with no gout flare. But, right. and again, like you and I've been talking, I'm finger stick, I finger stuck, stuck before I had the two drinks and then at 30 minutes, one hour and two hours. So you can, you can literally track it. What happens to the the sudden rise in the liver and then extracellularly is very fast. So what I'm, I tell pe- my followers is that you have a personal decision to make at some point. Uh, are you comfortable with hyperuricemia? 
you know, whatever it turns out, that number is going to be. How do you know the number? Because you should be testing and, and knowing yourself and see what it is and then make a decision. And I, I made the decision. Uh, I, I was on it all up here and all, then I was off and then I was on it. Why, why the, <laughs> why the up and down? Because I've really been struggling with the very argument you're bringing up. And the first time around, I'm like, you know, there's no data that says having a uric acid at eight is not healthy. It might be healthy. It might not be healthy. And no one seems to know. And like there's, and as hard as I work to find data, I can't find it. You can find a lot of associational stuff, but you can't find any data like, like the kind of data you get out of the Johnson lab. Um, and so I, I went back on it and honestly, I'm still struggling. <laughs> I'm going, should I be doing this? You know, and my uric acid right now is between four and five. And that's, this is what I got out of Johnson. He's like, if you're going to take the stuff, where do you want to fall? You know, how much should I take and where do I want to fall? Fall between four and five. That's where I am right now. Am I thinking about coming off of it again? Yeah. And I don't have an answer for you or, or to the people that you work with, because it's like, it's really a gray zone. And I think that the doctors that are adamant about one way or the other, mm -hmm. they need to admit that they don't know, <laughs> you know, which is the conversation I had with Dr. Seibest, quite honestly, at the same meeting that you were at, okay. I, I followed him into the hallway and, and because him and I, I've done an interview with him. I've had other communications through the nutrition network. And I, I did, I, I cornered him in the hallway and I said, what's your view about this? Of course, he gave me the view that as someone at seven or eight, you know, is fine. And I finally just said, do you have any data at all that shows if somebody is hyperuricemia, have hyperuricemia and they're not gouty, that it is safe to have uric acid at that level? And I finally got him to say, no, my daughter was standing right next to me. <laughs> and, uh, and he said, no, we don't have any data. I said, all right, well, thank you. That's what I want to know. Because I think that any of us considering this decision needs to know that there's no data out there one way or the other for this. It's a personal decision. It's a, like you said, it's a comfort level. Where are you at with this? And I tell my followers and I'm telling you and anyone who's listening to this, I'm still not comfortable. And I may come off of the all up here and all again and just put my faith in the lifestyle and sure. down so the road we go. So I picked Dr. Johnson's brain a lot about this. And that was part of the decision tree of if you're hyperuricemic, what marker? And essentially we got down to him. He doesn't like the number to be above eight or nine and consistently because at a certain point, the crystallization can ha happen in the blood vessels and it's not ideal. And I think he said it was around eight or nine. And so I think it, so where I, my comfort level reading Amber's paper, and there was a few other papers that. Dr. Johnson gave me, if I find him, I'll send them to you as well. But he talks about how there can be a chance that the ketones are the beta hydroxybutyrate is protective with uric acid. And so it may be okay to be at that level of maybe even eight. And so for Dr. Johnson, who obviously specializes in this gout or the uric acid levels and the polyol pathway and things like that, he is comfortable with given my circumstance, uh, that if, as long as I don't go beyond eight, he would not put me on medication or have me worried. But again, it follows that whole, but am I eating fructose? Am I having high purine foods? Am I consuming alcohol? And then, um, measuring all of those. And then if I still truly have a marker of eight milligrams per deciliter and I have ketones, it may be okay. And then also considering all the other metabolic markers. Again, I don't think that you, like you said, there's really a lot of research to back this, but just from the few papers I read, I felt comfortable that I was in that. I, I don't have gout flares. None of my family struggles with gout, but we had metabolic syndrome. So I am watchful of it. And that is why I decided to bring this up in the carnivore community. I think everyone thinks if I don't drink alcohol, if I don't have a uh, fructose, um, meaning like the high fructose corn syrup, then I'm safe from gout and hyperuricemia, but I don't think it holds true for everybody. And so it's a nuanced discussion to have in our community because it does affect us. I agree with that. Yeah. I think it's nuanced. That's a, a great way to leave it. You know, we're all individuals. We need to, uh, we need to look at our, what our situation is. I think that 
one of the issues with uric acid, we didn't talk about this yet, but um, one of the problems is that it's just not measured, right? The first time I ever heard about it was when I had the gout flare in 2016. I had no idea. And uh, in my journey of the research that I've done in this, you know, it's become apparent that we really don't know what the uric acid fluctuations are in humans from the time when they're, when they're babies. There's lots of gaps in the data, lots of gaps with it. And I think it's a marker that probably should be monitored, you know, um, from the time we pop into the world, we should at least know what, you know, what the condition of the mother is too, preceding it you know, the birth of the child. And then at some kind of regular interval that that gets closer together, the older that we get so that we actually know better what the fluctuations are in humans. And based on, you know, the diets that we're eating so that people can make interventions earlier, because the primary, there can be lots of reasons why we're hyperuricemic. But I think the primary candidate is a dysfunction in the proximal tubules of the kidney. And that comes from chronic, this, the chronic ingestion of the standard American diet, because the proximal tubule cells are processing fructose, hyperglycemia, the polyol pathway, and then the effects of alcohol are all happening there. So you end up with the chronic inflammation there. And then when you have the sudden acute rise in the uric acid, that's when you can get the damage. And for someone like me, there probably is. I haven't uh, been able to confirm this, but I think I'm probably suffering from a kidney defect that way. I mean, I think that's where it comes from. And so we're not excreting the uric acid the way we should be. My thought would be though, that if you have ketones, and I know you said that some people after they're really fat adapted, then their uric acid goes down. I don't think everybody that still produces ketones, that same thing holds true. I know for me, it doesn't, for example, another thing is, um, I know this is just N equals one, but I, I checked my kids for a while as well. And they were also hyperuricemic and they're, I would say most days they have some level of ketones in their bloodstream, but And one of my children is very lean and he eats mostly meat and really not much else. And he's never drank alcohol. It doesn't have organ meats. He used to a long time ago, but, and occasionally he'll he'll have fructose, but not a lot, but his, he has high hyperuricemia as well. And he's only five, but he also has ketones as well. So it's just really interesting. I think there's still discussions to be had. And I think you're right. At the end of the day, it's people's own individual journey to figure out at what level of uh, the higher levels of uric acid are you comfortable with? But I would also just consider metabolic syndrome, you know, your kidney function, you can always do like a ultrasound on your kidneys to test. Do you have any dysfunction in your kidneys to see? Is that one of the reasons your uric acid is high? Or is it that you have high ketones and that may be inhibiting some of the uric acid to be removed from the body? It's just interesting, I'd say. I think it is. And yeah, I didn't mean to imply that that's like the only thing I, there can be lots of reasons why people are hyperuricemic for sure. And again, I think this is all part of it that, I mean, I'm really happy in this day and age at this point in our space that there's way more science going on now than, than there has been in the past. Right. Because I think we really need to know this stuff better than we do. Um, because people are suffering and I want to help them and you want to help them. And the question is, how do you make rational decisions, you know, based on, you know, what we know, and there's a ton that we don't know. So, well, thank you. I mean, you've enlightened our community so much. Uh, Where can people find you, your YouTube channel and other social media places that people can find you? So my YouTube channel is Dr. Pete's Keto Club. And uh, we publish two thirds of what we publish there is on gout at this point. And then our website is uh, www.makesme-healthy.com. And we have coaching programs there. We have a gout remission online course. It's actually half off. (laughs) And I'll Uh, put all of this in the show notes so people can find you and make it very easy for people to find you. Yeah. And on the online course, uh, they get access to me if they have questions and things like that. They can just, yeah, they can text in and ask me whatever they want. um, And they get some free coaching with that. So yeah, we, the Dr. Pete's keto club and (laughs) www.makesme-healthy.com. 
Well, thank you so much. This has been such a wonderful conversation. I know there's a lot of questions still remaining about gout and uric acid, but it's a lot more comprehensive than when people hear from their doctor, you have gout or you have high levels of uric acid. That's why you're probably struggling with gout. Therefore you should cut down your red meat. And it's this simple solution when the, the, the issue is a lot bigger at hand. And we see it in the carnivore community or the ketogenic community when there's a lot of people with hyperuricemia and they're not getting gout. Like you mentioned, there's a big discrepancy in the number of millions where so many people have hyperuricemia that never struggle with gout. And then there's people that have gout that their markers are actually not hyperuricemic. And so it's just, I know it's very nuanced, but it's so important, especially when people are struggling with gout too discuss these important things. Well, I agree with you. And to, uh, I know we're closing out, but just to, to piggyback on what you said about someone who goes to the doctor and the doctor says, well, you're hyper, you're so don't eat red meat. Well, here's the thing. If they are going to get gout, not eating red meat, but s- still drinking the alcohol and the you know the rest of it, the high fructose corn syrups and, and being hyperglycemic, it's not going to help them. I mean, if they are destined for gout, that's not going to help them, you know? So, yeah. And it's wild to me that the doctors only blame the meat. It's so wild to me. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Well, thank you so much. I, I, I thoroughly enjoyed this conversation. I've learned more about uric acid. And now I know that if even when people reduce the purines, maybe they have to take one step further and then look at what foods are they eating that are really high in glutamate and even possibly some of the stearic acid and just all these other nuances that essentially my goal with my community is hopefully they don't have to get on a lot of medications and they could just focus on healing the body itself that the body can just function on its own. And I feel that there's always this threshold that people have to overcome, allow the body to fully heal so that the body can then function on its own. Yes, absolutely. Well, thank you so much for your time. It was a very great honor to be here with you. I really appreciate it. And uh, any, any time you want to get together and talk again is fine. Yes. Yes. Okay. Thank you. (laughs) All right. Bye. Bye. Okay, guys, I hope that you enjoyed this interview. I know there was a lot of nuance, but I hope that it helps you to understand, especially if you're suffering from gout, why it may happen and what the steps are that you can do to start supporting your health. Like Dr. Pete mentioned, you may want to focus on the first, the three things that he mentioned, which is hyperglycemia, alcohol, and then all the fructose, including possibly fruits, but maybe you don't have to remove it right away. Again, you're going to have to consider your age and your metabolic health and the metabolic syndrome that you may have been struggling with for a long time. After those three things, if you are still suffering from gout, you may want to reduce your purine content. I highly recommend checking out my conversation with Dr. Richard Johnson as we get into the details of what the polyol pathway is, uric acid, and how our natural evolution was to create this switch for protective mechanisms, but now is being used as an adverse thing for our health. I hope that this conversation gave you another lever to get to root cause healing. And I hope that you realize you don't have to suffer from gout flares for the rest of your life. There are things you can do to manage this debilitating disease. While you're here, please make sure to like and subscribe. And on podcast, please make sure to leave a review. Okay, guys, you know the drill. Make sure to eat a lot of meat. Take care of your bodies because it is the only place you have to live. I will talk to you guys later. Bye, guys.